why do we not punish free speech because it's dragging souls to hell and it's so clearly against the Christian political order. Do you trust the government? Not at all, no. Then why are you a socialist? For people to not even have the opportunity to try because somebody has sentenced them to death. That money has helped them embarrass Russia on a national stage, right? So we're spending oh. trillions of dollars to embarrass Russia. Welcome back to Rattlesnake TV, guys. In this video, we are going to be watching Candace Owens and Charlie Kirk in some very interesting and at times very heated exchanges with college students about subjects ranging from abortion to free speech, socialism, the war in Ukraine, and and more. So with that, let's get into the first one. Thank you for being here tonight. This question is directed to Mr. Kirk. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, our Lord says, But he that shall scandalize one of these little ones that believeth in me, it were better for him that a millstone should be hanged about his neck, and that he should be drowned in the depth of the sea. So here our Lord is talking about moral actions, inclusive of speech that is contrary to Christian morality and the gospel, and he says it ought to be punished and at minimum assigned a social penalty. So we look out today and our society is being degenerated. We're seeing transgenderism, homosexuality, feminism, and other various social evils being promoted, yet conservatives continually promote this idea of free speech, which is directly allowing these things to flourish and is actually normalizing them. So my question is, as someone that takes the Bible very seriously, like yourself, why do you not believe the words of our Lord? Why do we not punish free speech because it's dragging souls to hell and it's so clearly against the Christian political order? Well, you're putting words in my mouth, first of all. I, I think that speech at its highest place should point to virtue. So for example, I would happily use the force of government to prevent drag queen story hour in front of children, right? So I encourage you not to misrepresent the position of the speaker, right? But there's a balance. There's a balance between expression, speech, petition against the government, and something that is obviously not speech. So this is where I'm more in the Sorab Amari camp and not the David French camp. I don't think being able to rent out a library to do predatory sexual behavior to children should be constitutionally protected speech. That's the founding fathers did not have in mind, boy, we need a robust First Amendment so that a bunch of groomers can get in front of eight-year-olds. Right. That is not their idea of speech. With that being said, we have to be obviously careful because when you start to overly police types of political speech against institutions or organizations, that is what the First Amendment is before. The First Amendment allows you to complain, it allows you to challenge, it allows you to be able to organize people. And I could say that the only reason I'm allowed to speak at University of California Davis is they were afraid I was gonna sue them under First Amendment practices. Where I will find agreement because you cited one of the many times Jesus says in the New Testament about the harsh punishment of going after children is that any conservative that uses the First Amendment flippantly while children are being abused and groomed, they have no place in the conservative movement whatsoever. And so I just, I'll, I'll close with that. Thank you, appreciate it. So this is a very interesting question and it's one that brings up a topic that is very topical in the current political discourse. I often see the libertarian conservatives and the more staunch conservatives at loggerheads about this exact issue. You see, during this cultural revolution that we've been enduring, and that's what we should call it because that's what it is, you very often see conservatives trying to appease woke liberals. They say things that they know that they want to hear and it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think this is the conservative way of having discourse. You generally try and appease to people with logic and reason. You try to steel man their worldview and meet them halfway somewhat. But oftentimes in this culture war, what we'll find is that when that level of respect is shown, it's never reciprocated by the radical left. Racist, homophobic, transphobic, he's a spoiler. It feels as though when the right wing will move closer to the center to try and get some sort of semblance of normality back into the discourse, the left will just move further and further to the left. And I think that this is fundamentally because the people on the extreme left side of the spectrum don't actually believe in discourse. They believe in power. We can only stop male violence against women by ending male domination, by eradicating patriarchy. Patriarchy is the problem. Beta! And obviously in our cultural and political institutions, they currently wield the power. So the question becomes, how do you combat that? Well, the more libertarian conservative approach would be to say, hey, listen, 
We have our worldview. This is how we want to live our lives. And we understand that you have your worldview. That's how you want to live your life. As long as you don't try and impose yourself on us, then we'll do the same. But the problem with this is that the deceivers will say, yeah, sure, no worries, we get you. And then as soon as you turn your back, you have drag queen story hour, you have DEI, you have cancel culture, you have egregious and gratuitous forms of blasphemy and other subversive activities. And so this is where it becomes rather interesting. And the question on the more sort of staunch conservative side of the political spectrum Spectrum becomes if we do believe in being left alone and if we do believe in being able to harbor our own values and raise our own families and build our own communities with our values, then is there a point where this cultural revolution reaches a fever pitch which would necessitate defeating the enemy at their own game, the game of wielding power? And this is where things can get pretty dangerous politically. So really interested to hear your thoughts on that one. Did this gentleman raise a good point? Do you see this sort of cultural conversation happening and what would be your remedy for the situation? Now onto the next part where a socialist comes up and gives his perspective on things. And I wanna particularly focus here on how Candace Owens handles this objection. Uh, so first thing I'd like to mention is that my mother and father wanted me to say hello for them because they couldn't be here and they're big fans <laughs> of you. Hi mom but, and dad. Yeah, but I'm the socialist they raised. Uh, so I would like to ask you a question in opposition. Um, I was like, so what I, say? I, I'm the socialist they raised, so I'm saying I'm, I'm asking a question in opposition. Um, and that yeah, no worries. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. Thank you. Uh, I said, how can we rel have relativize a love for America when we have a long history of being anti-democratic overseas, being involved in, in coups in Chile, Guatemala, that have been supported by both democratic and Republican institutions? Hold on. I am just just to be clear. Yeah. You want me to repeat it? Yeah. Thank you. I could tell you're a little nervous, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restate the question. The question but for thank you for and, being I'm glad here. glad you're here. Did he say, how uh, can we... He said, how can we maintain love for America because of our anti-democratic foreign policy, in particular supporting coups in Chile, Latin America, around the world? Did I summarize that pretty well? Yeah. More, yeah. More, yeah that's I think this kind of ties back into the last answer that we just gave because that does not represent America. That re represents crooked politicians that are in D.C. that has us in endless wars. <laughs> Staging coups, the color revolution that we staged in Ukraine, which is absolutely what happened. We staged a color rev revolution in Ukraine to insert Zelensky because politicians are corrupt in D.C. And I, I, it is very difficult for people to differentiate, you know, what we're talking about here. Something has gone terribly wrong in America. That is a fact. This is not the, this is not the America that your grandparents grew up in. That is a fact. Something happened with these globalist initiatives, them recognizing sometime after 9-11 that they can keep us in endless wars and keep sending trillions of dollars, sending our sons and daughters to go overseas. And let me be very clear, when I criticize this, we are not at all criticizing the people that went overseas and believed right. in our country and believed in our values and never could have fathomed that our government could be this crooked, this awful, this backwards, and doing this all for profit. But that is a circumstance. We didn't pull out of Afghanistan because Biden cares about your sons and daughters. We pulled out of Afghanistan, in my personal opinion, because they have an incredible resource. Um, uh, what's the one for in, in batteries? Not uranium. Um, Guys, if you're enjoying this video and if you want this to go far and wide, then don't forget to chuck a like on this bad boy. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you do so, welcome to the community. Back to it. Lithium, yeah, one of the yeah, and they need for and, and they're gonna mine it, and this is why they're pushing all of this ESG agenda. Uh, it is so much more Machiavellian, like I said, and I don't find your sentiment, what you're talking about, to be socialist at all. By the way, the question that you asked, at least, it's a major problem, and the only way that we're going to fix it is to disempower people in D.C. And that is something that people on the left and the right should be agreeing and coming together on. So, can can I just ask you a quick question? So, you're a socialist that is worried about some government activity, do you trust the government? Not at all, no. Then why are you a socialist? Um, well, because, no, because I understand, I understand socialism not as that. I don't understand socialism as being pro, I, 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 I don't, I distrust hierarchies, right? And I think that a, a socialist, what they want is, is that the, the, they want more democracy. You want the people to be the ones in power. You want, you want the, it, now they do say the dictatorship of- Guys, guys, be nice, because he, he, he really, you know, he's trying to understand it. No, what I would, I, I would very much say that you, you should study what socialism actually, I know what it's sold as, I know what they bill it as, right? When like, I know what the bill says it's gonna be amazing, people are gonna have power. You gotta check in with the Venezuelans, maybe as a starting point. Check in with the Cubans who believed in Fidel Castro. Check in over the last 100 years, how many people have died because they sold them a narrative. And what really happened was the government then seized all the power from the people, promised they would redistribute it, but it is 
isn't what happened. The average Venezuelan citizen has lost something like 23 pounds. It kills every single time. So you're probably someone that has a really big heart and you actually believe that the government has too much power and so you believe it when people like AOC say, we're going to fight and we're going to return power to the people. That's not what they're going to do. What she's doing is she's fighting for government to grow until it becomes so insurmountable that you are rendered powerless and the individual is rendered powerless. That's what socialism actually is, not what it's billed as. But thank you so much for your thank question. You. I really it. appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. So really strong answer there by Candace. And also she did a really good job of almost nurturing this young man in that exchange because the rhetoric that he was espousing was extremely basic, sort of entry level college socialist type stuff. I don't understand socialism as being pro I, I, I don't I distrust hierarchies and also he did appear to me to be someone whose perspectives were quite malleable and probably somebody who's pretty receptive to new information and I mean maybe some of you guys are similar in the sense that that was me once upon a time I used to think the same way because I bought the big lie of social justice I used to look at the world and all of the injustice and all of the disparity around me and in my young idealistic mind I would think to myself well it's easy if we could just take all of the money from the greedy rich people and give it to all of the benevolent poor people, then everything would be equal and all of the world's problems would just be fixed. Patriarchy is the problem. And finally, the socialist utopia would come about because the other tries, they weren't real socialism. But Candace handled that graciously there and hopefully did a good job of planting the seed that will hopefully change his mind and bring him around to the cold reality of socialism in practice. And I think that this attitude is particularly important because we want to be rewarding the behavior of young people who come to events like this and they come with this agreements, but also with an open mind and in good faith. This is the sort of attitude that is not being trained in the universities at the moment. In the universities, they are breeding activists. They're not teaching people how to think, they're teaching people what to think. So this is the sort of attitude that we want to foster. So I really appreciate Candace's attitude here. I mean, even if they do say something dumb, it's how young people learn. However, what I will say is if they come in bad faith, or if they are older, a professor, an intellectual, a politician, a journalist, etc., then that's when I believe it's time to take the gloves off and have at it. But hey, maybe I'm too overzealous. Anyways, the next part is about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. My question is, you guys um, were discussing blue collar workers and how they have a lot of wisdom, which I certainly agree with. I'm sure they do have a lot of wisdom. However, um, your guys' perspective more so sounded like they essentially have more wisdom or more knowledge than someone in academia. And my question is, why do you guys believe that blue collar workers and people um, in these laborious jobs have more knowledge than someone in academia? academia and is that rooted or what how how is that factually rooted so I guess I would say rather than saying wisdom I would say that they have more real world value and currency than somebody who's writing papers trying to transform the world from a classroom and I, I genuinely believe that I believe that there is more value in learning to work with your hands there's more value in learning how to raise productive human beings I I hate the fact that women are being sold a bill of lies and being told that we should be competing with men and wanting to run executives of you know fortune 500 companies I, I believe that we absolutely flourish in our feminine roles and that the toughest job in the world is being a stay-at-home mom and raising good children um, so to me when we shifted those values and we stopped realizing that these people actually have the most value to society, in society, we watched our social decline begin. And we have essentially been within a managed social decline for the last 60 years, in my opinion. I, I would add to that, um, anyone has to take a sociology class or anthropology class here? Yeah, um, have a kid. <laughs> You'll learn a lot more about human beings than anything a textbook could teach 100%, you. 100% true. Experience always is going to override what it, you can it, learn it, in a book. By the way, I would say you conflated two words, knowledge and wisdom. They're not right. the same thing. Not. There's, a, there's a lot of knowledge here at Ohio State University. There's not a lick of wisdom in most of these classrooms. And what is the difference? Very simple. Knowledge is practical. How do you develop a medication? How do you navigate Build an Build a house. Build a house. That's fine. Knowledge is important. Wisdom tells you whether or not you should do it. Wisdom is eternal. Wisdom does not change. Wisdom is the knowledge of things that will be true 200 years from now, and they were true 500 years before, because you're dealing with the same raw material. Human beings do not change. We are broken from nature, and it takes effort to create good people. The reason why college campuses are devoid of wisdom is because the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Thank you so much.
I love that. There's a lot of knowledge on the campus, but not a lick of wisdom because wisdom is something that is eternal. And when you think about it with that correct logic, that wisdom is the eternal things that will always be and things that always have been, it makes sense that blue collar workers actually do have a lot of wisdom because they actually have a fundamental and practical understanding of how the world works at ground zero. And I've grown up around blue collar workers. And personally, what I've always found is that there is an air of wisdom about these people. And not just because of the skill itself, but also because of the toil that goes into it. I think there's something about physical, practical labor that almost grounds people in reality. Whereas if you're a YouTuber, for example, I mean, sure, there might be some wisdom in it. And there's always going to be a place for alternative voices and alternative forms of entertainment. But when you really think about it, it is rather transient and fickle. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. When you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Anyways, guys, I need some time to think about my future. So on to the next clip where this fella struggles to get his question out a little bit, but the substance of the question does elicit a very interesting response from Candace. Hi, um, I'm nervous I'm in front of two future US presidents, but oh. <laughs> I wanted to ask and uh, hear both your point of views, especially towards Candace, but you know how they pushed the sexual liberation agenda. Slow down, slow down, slow down. Sexual what agenda? Slow sexual down. liberation agenda. Liberation, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. What's your take on a young lady who got pregnant and the man who got her pregnant tells her to abort the baby because he doesn't care for the kid and does not want to be in that kid's life? She has no family, no help, and she wants to focus on school and her, uh, in her career. Is it best for her to get rid of the kid and focus on herself and having a family later down the road? Because uh, if she has that kid, that child's going to be a burden upon her. Did you catch it? You want me to repeat? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can repeat it. So I think you're, res I, I you're think giving you're us a scenario of somebody who's pregnant with a kid. That was the this the Ohio situation it? of the young lady that went to Indiana to get the abortion? Or are you just talking more generally? generally. Talking generally. You're talking generally. Okay. okay. And you're saying that if the kid was born, they would be ill advantaged. Is that what you're, yep. what you're asking that? And your, and your end question is what should they what do? She, yeah, what should she do? Should she just like get abortion rid of the baby? ethics, no. basically, or, is the question. You, know, yeah. have family you, you should family. absolutely choose life. It's, it's, it's such a scary thing to me to think. And actually, who was it that said, I think it was Ronald Reagan, you know, everybody who argues for abortion has already been born, right? Which, is, which the many examples, and this is what is so problematic about the argument of people that are pro-choice, is that it ignores all of the people that grew up in broken homes and made something of themselves, people who were adopted, people that grew up in group homes, what they were able to contribute to society. It basically says the argument that unless your life is, is rosy, unless you have a rosy start, then there, you, didn't, you don't have a right to life and your life is not worth living, and that could not be more wrong and more backwards. It's, it's so wrong. I especially, you guys obviously know a lot about my upbringing, like my story is one that I hope serves as an example when people read it of what can happen when you triumph your idea, this idea of victimhood, when you realize that you're not a victim and that you are always in the driver's seat of your own life and you can be a victor. Everybody, by the way, has terrible things that happen in their lives. Don't believe that because you see somebody and they grew up and they're super wealthy that they don't have issues or people that actually, I personally find that the wealthiest kids are the most effed up personally What I life, right? right. And it, it, for people to not even have the opportunity to try because somebody has sentenced them to death and said your life is not worth living because you don't have a father that loves you or a mother that wants you, it deeply saddens me. It's so backwards. It is so antithetical to everything that we believe as conservatives. If you meet a conservative that says, well, I'm a little flimsy on the life stuff, they don't know what it means to be a conservative. Fundamentally at our core is that we believe in life, right? We believe in life and the right to life. Um, and so, absolutely, in every scenario, I would choose life over and over again. And let me tell you, just as someone who has had a child, your life begins, you th if you think in a moment while you're pregnant that it may be a burden um, and you may be fearful, when you have that child, you will realize that life begins when you become a mother or a father. It is the most beautiful, wonderful chapter of anybody's life, no matter how difficult it may be. I do not believe there's a thing as an unwanted child in America. There's a million abortions in America every single year, about 3,000 a day. And there's twice as many people than that on the adoption waiting list. So if every single person who had an abortion had that baby and put them up for adoption, they could all be put up and adopted twice over in America. There's no such thing as an unwanted child in America. Thank you. So she's spitting absolute facts there, guys. Conservatives choose life. And when you really think about it, 
This is a fundamental pillar of conservatism. Like if you were to call yourself a true conservative, then you are absolutely pro-life. And this kind of relates to what we were saying before, how conservatives will often try and move to the center. And a way that they try and do that is they try and say, I'm conservative, but I'm pro-choice, for example. When in reality, it actually doesn't serve people to do that because the left aren't gonna turn around and be like, oh wow, look at all of that nuance. Look how balanced that person is. They're MAGA, they're pro-gun, they're anti-feminism. They speak out against LGBTQ, but they're pro-life. It just doesn't work like that. They still hate you. And at that point, you've become a useful idiot. What are you? An idiot sandwich. Because that is a position that is antithetical to the conservative worldview. Because conservatives fundamentally believe in life, as Candace Owens alluded to. They believe that life starts at conception. So therefore, from that moment on, that is a human life that is worthy of protection. And it's not arbitrary either. I mean, the science is very clear on that. And no biologist who is worth their salt would dispute the fact that life starts at conception. Furthermore, Conservatives also believe in gender roles. They believe that men have a certain role and that women have a certain role. And those roles perfectly complement each other to create the perfect recipe for life. Moreover, they believe that people should be choosing to have kids instead of an extra bedroom or an extra holiday every year. They also believe in pronatal policies that benefit people who have children and actually help to maintain a healthy birth rate within a society. And what's more, on a more global scale, I would say that conservatives are people who are definitely, definitely against the anti-humanist agenda of the climate cult, for example. So I do think that Candace Owens is on the money there when she's trying to represent the conservative worldview. That is morally and philosophically very consistent of her. And now onto the next part about the Russia-Ukraine war. And I've actually covered this clip about nine or 10 months ago on the channel, but I thought that it was necessary to actually watch it again because it's aged so well for Candace. And I also wanted to watch the difference between how she handles this guy compared to the last guy, because this guy comes in quite cocky and he gets slightly rougher treatment than the last. Hey. Hi, uh, so I have a disagreement with your guys uh, take in Ukraine. Um, as I understand it, your position is that, you know, it's, it's really expensive, we shouldn't be sending all this money, and it's also none of our business, right? Um, I disagree with that because, one, I think it's morally right, but also, even from a national interest standpoint, right, that money, uh, you know, the Ukrainians have definitely done a lot, but that money has helped them embarrass Russia on a national stage, right? Like before, we believed that they were a big power, and now they've embarrassed themselves. Um, and also, uh, I, th I think that Western solidarity is really important, right? I mean, like, especially with China eyeing Taiwan, we need to show them internationally that we're a solidified force. We can't they can't just go and take it. We need to show that we can defend. Uh, so we're spending ourselves. trillions of dollars to embarrass Russia? That's like, was it a little bit of embarrassment? Is that what we're trying to do? You think that we should be recycling millions of dollars and having millions of dollars disappear into thin air so that we can say, ooh, look, Vladimir Putin is embarrassed. And if by embarrassed, you mean shaking hands with Xi Jinping, talking about how things are going to change and that the next 100 years are not going to look like the last 100 years, then you are not paying attention to what is going on. We have just pushed <laughs> Vladimir Putin into the arms of China. Right, the, the, one of our greatest, the greatest competitor that we possible have is China. They're shaking hands. They're openly mocking the West. This has never happened before, right? They think the West is a joke, and the, and why shouldn't they? Look at us. We're having debates about gender. We don't know what a woman is. Okay, Hollywood. We think that it's cool to have Zelensky make attendances at the Grammys. It's a joke. It's a complete and utter joke. So no. First and foremost, we talked about national interest. National interest require that it was in our nation or an impact to us. It's not my effing business what happens in the Eastern Corridor while we have real Americans that are suffering today. And if you notice, it's been non-stop wars that we haven't lost. Do you want to talk about embarrassment? Try leaving billions of dollars of technology in Afghanistan after spending decades fighting. That's embarrassment. That's embarrassment. What's embarrassing is China then flying immediately after we magically evacuate and meeting with the Taliban and immediately recognizing them as a government. We had daughters and our sons that died. What did we win? What about those weapons of mass destruction? Was this the 20th anniversary of Iraq? You Just want about. to talk about embarrassment? The things that we did in Iraq, the things that we've done all across the world, and for what? What do you have to show for it? Well, 
I guess we embarrassed a few people while we had people, we were sending Americans over to die. At least we were able to embarrass a few people in the process. That's not a good way to think, I'm gonna tell you right now. That's not a good way to think. We should think about prioritizing all of the issues that we have in America. You wanna talk about an invasion? Let's talk about the one that's happening at our border every single day. That's what we mean when we say America first, okay? We have plenty of issues to solve. Not a single red cent should be sent overseas until we fix what's happening here in the United States. Thank you for your question. I'll, I'll add one thing. Just Candace makes a fabulous point that needs to be repeated and repeated. A country that cannot determine what a woman is should not go to war. How embarrassing, how embarrassing. Now, th this, is, this is a general rule for conflict. You, if, if, if you have a domestic crisis where you are not able to agree on basic truths, you are not a nation ready to go for China's it. writing articles, their newspapers, they're literally writing articles mocking America about how we don't know what bathroom to go into, right? About how we sent the full force of the military to shoot down a Hobby Lobby balloon, right? If you think that we, that the embarrassment that Russia is embarrassed, you haven't been paying attention to what's happening in America. Honestly, and, and we become a mock. We're being mocked in the Eastern, in the Eastern Corridor. And, and I'll go even a step further. It's a tragic geopolitical mistake that Russia is not neutral, it's not an ally with us against the Chinese Communist Party. All this Huge. saber rattling that, you know, it's the, it's the Cold War and Russia against us. It didn't have to be this way. Donald Trump Cold had, War hangover. It's yeah, Cold War hangover. It, it, Donald Trump had it in the right position. The Chinese Communist Party is the great threat against the West and American liberty, and now they have a gas station. The Chinese Communist Party now has more oil reserves than they know what to do with in a great super alliance that we helped create. Please what study the pipelines. Really understand. It, it's really understand. This is not about scoring points. This is not about running an article on CNN and Washington Post saying, oh, look, we embarrassed. You need to study the map of the pipelines and understand what he, exactly what he is talking about when he is saying the threat of an alliance between Russia and China. They don't care about some points on the board saying, oh, look, it, it's, it's so serious. We are in such a severe state right now. When I I say it is managed social decline, managed political decline. We are no longer being taken seriously on the world stage. When I watched, it was I think it was Russia Today, a clip that my executive producers pulled of them openly laughing and mocking the American military, unfathomable even four years ago when Trump was in office, unfathomable. They're openly mocking us. They don't take the West seriously because why should we be taking seriously? We're arguing over bathroom signs over here. So like I said before, I think this one aged very well and will probably continue to age like fine wine. So that's it for me today, guys. I do hope you appreciated that video. If you'd like to find me below, you can hit those links. If you would like to subscribe to the channel, you can click right here. If you'd like to watch another video, right here. Till next time, I'm Jake. This is Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous.